Well, I have been off for a couple of weeks. It's great to be back, and thank you to everybody who uh, filled in the different gaps in my absence. Uh, this time, we didn't do much for our vacation. This is sort of a staycation for us this year. Uh, stayed really close to home, and I told Nadine at the start of the vacation that I'm going to do one project a day, and then the rest of the day, I'm just going to rest and take it easy. And it worked out pretty well for the most part. Did a lot of projects around the house. Got some shelves hung up and, you know, some touch up on some paint and uh, drain the hot water tank, which I hadn't done for five years to see what that had in store for us. Worked on my truck, got new brakes and getting some body work done on there. So, so I did a number of projects, which I uh, enjoy doing, but I also rested as well. And for me, resting means going to the gym and reading and napping and binging Netflix. And something else I did was I, I completed a puzzle, which never do. And I, I did it myself in one week, which I thought was pretty good because one week, I never done, I hardly ever do puzzles. And so to finish one on my own in a week, I thought was pretty good because on the box, it even said like two to three years on there. And so, so I, thought I'd, I thought I'd done pretty well on there. Yes. And I'm back with a whole fresh list of jokes for you. <laughs> so anyways, hey, there's a lot of people like me, especially guys, we like to stay busy. True. We like to stay busy. Uh, it makes me happy to stay busy to do projects. Uh, it also, to be honest with you, it keeps me out of trouble okay, when, when I have some things to do. Because uh, who, who's heard that saying before, you know, idle hands are the devil's workshop? You've probably heard that before. Yeah. It, it's actually based upon a proverb. It comes from Proverbs 16. It's where that comes from. And now here's something important to note about that. Is it's important to note there's a difference between resting and idleness. You see, resting is good. Taking vacations is good. Making sure we have time to replenish our, our bodies and our spirits and our emotions is good. It's even a spiritual discipline. Uh, we see it in the Ten Commandments, right? To take a Sabbath, to take a day of rest. Resting is good. Idleness, however, is different. Idleness is different. See, idleness, we can define that as doing nothing when you should be doing something. When you're doing nothing, when you should be doing something, you've slipped into that realm of idleness. And you know what? The story we're going to look at today from the life of David, it looks like David is resting, but in fact, he's actually idle. And in the midst of his idleness, he grows restless. And when he becomes restless, the devil was definitely at work in the midst of his story. And so we're going to look at a classic story today. It's found in, in 2 Samuel chapter 11. If you want to flip there, the Pew Bibles, that's found on page 247. Uh, and of course, we've got the Pew Portal. If you want to find the sermon notes, just scan that code in front of you. I'll take you right to the sermon notes. They're always there for you. And at this point in the story, up until now, David has been busy. He's been busy establishing and securing the nation of Israel. He has been leading and winning many battles to establish that kingdom. And he's reached a point where Israel is so powerful in the region that they're not even fighting as many battles anymore. They're just sort of establishing peace pacts with other people in the region. And this has brought incredible stability to the nation of Israel at this time. And then so much so that when some trouble starts to emerge that needs to be quelled, where in the past David would lead the army to go deal with it, this time David decides he's going to have himself a staycation. And we see this in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. It says, In the springtime, at the time when kings would go off to war, David sent Joab out the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and they besieged Rabbath. But David remained in Jerusalem. And then one evening, David got up from his bed and he was walking around on the roof of the palace. And from the roof, he saw a beautiful woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. The Israelite army, the Ark of the Covenant of God, is in the battlefield. David should have been in the battlefield leading the way. But he stayed home. Which would have been fine if he was resting, but he was restless. He was doing nothing when he should have been doing something. And in such a moment, I think we can all relate to this and understand this, that in such a moment, our human nature and the devil are all too eager to give us something to do. And in this case for David, it's for something to see. And now, let's be fair. We, we can't blame David for the first glance. That was, that was just a chance encounter. But we can blame him for the second one. We can blame him for the third one. 
And we can blame him when his mind becomes fixated upon what he's looking at to the point where he has to know who that is. And he sends some people to find out who it is, and they tell him that it's a woman by the name of Bathsheba. And that she is the daughter of Eliam, and that she is the wife of Uriah. So David knows immediately that she's married, and he knows that so is he. But he also knows this family. He knows that, that Eliam, he knows Uriah are great soldiers. David has fought alongside these men, these men of honor that David has gone to war with. But in his mind, he's already broken the Tenth Commandment. Remember the tenth one? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And the scheming is already starting to brew. And so he has Bathsheba brought to him, and they break the seventh commandment. Thou shall not commit adultery. Now a few weeks pass, and David tries to sort of move on from this and forget about it, but then the news reaches him that Bathsheba is pregnant. Now here's the thing. What, what about sin, and we know this to be true as well, don't we, that, that when, when the shame and the guilt of our sin, when the consequences of our sinful actions come back to us, we face a moment of choice, don't we? We, we have the choice. We can either choose to, to, to bring it into light and, and come clean and the truth shall set you free, or, or we have the other choice, which is to continue down the path of sin and to keep trying to cover it up, right? Well, David chooses the later. David thinks to himself, you know, Uriah's off fighting a battle, but, but if Uriah were to come home, obviously he would go visit his wife. And then, and then they, when the child came, people would do the math on the calendar, and they'd be like, oh, well, yeah, that's when, when Uriah came home. Of course, it all lines up. And David's thinking to himself, this is too easy. And so under false pretenses, which, by the way, would be the breaking of the ninth commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness, David does this. In verse 6. So David sent word to Joab out in the battlefield. Send me Uriah the Hittite. And so Joab sent him to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked him, how, how is Joab doing? And how are the soldiers? And how is the war going? And after they had chatted for a while, then, then David said to Uriah, Why don't you go down to your house and, and wash your feet, he says. And so Uriah left the palace and the gifts that the king had sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the palace with all of the master's servants and did not go down to his house. As Uriah leaves, David wants to make sure he's going to have a good date night. So he gives him some gifts. He gives him food from the king's table to go home and, and have some quality time with his wife, Bathsheba. But Uriah is a soldier. But not just a soldier. He is a leader. And he thinks to himself, how in the world can I go home and enjoy the comforts of, of my own home, of my own bed, of, of my own wife. How can I possibly go home and enjoy that while my men and while the ark of the God is in the battlefield? How can I possibly do that? How can I stand in solidarity with my men and go do that? So he decides not even tell his wife that he's in town. He decides to not go home. He decides instead to sleep at the palace gate. Now, huge respect for Uriah. Well, I don't know what you would have done. To be honest, I probably would have gone home. <laughs> if it was me, I would have gone home. I maybe would have gone home and then, you know, gone back to the palace gates. But uh, I don't know. But Uriah decides, no, he is going to sleep at the palace gates. This makes David nervous. And he thinks, well, how can I weaken Uriah's resolve? He goes, I know. Before I send him back to the battlefield, I'll have him over for a, a dinner party in his honor. And I will get him so drunk. And surely then an inebriated Uriah would go home to sleep it off, right? No. Not even a drunken Uriah would do so. A, even, in fact, a drunken Uriah proves more pious than a sober David in this story. And so now David really feels the pressure mounting. And so in addition to breaking the 10th commandment and to breaking the 7th and to breaking the 9th, he de now decides that he's going to break the 6th commandment, which is, thou shalt not murder. Verse 14, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is the fiercest, and then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. Uriah delivers his own death sentence to Joab. And a few days later, a messenger arrives at David's courts and comes from the battlefield with an update 
for King David. And he says, King David, Joab sent me to report to you that we had a recent battle that was fierce. They overpowered us and they pushed us back. But we rallied, we rallied my king, we pushed them back to their city gates. But then the archers came and the, and the archers shot down from the walls. And, and my king, we lost many, many good men in that battle, including your servant, Uriah, who is dead. And as this news spread, David feels relief. Bathsheba feels crushed. In an effort to try to make things right, David wants to provide for her and for this child. And so he brings her into his palace and he makes her his wife. And as we get to the end of chapter 11, we read these final words. But the things that David had done displeased the Lord. They displeased the Lord. So he sent his prophet Nathan, whom David knows and welcomes into his court. And Nathan comes in and Nathan tells David a story. He says, David, King David, there is, there is this rich man and there is this poor man. There is this rich man who had everything he could ever want. And, and, and amongst that, he had huge, incredible herds of, of sheep and cattle. But then there's the, the poor man who had few possessions. But amongst his few meager possessions, he had one very special possession. His, this little lamb. This lamb that he had raised from the time it was born. This lamb that he had cared for. This lamb that had played with his kids as it grew and it was part of his family. This, this little lamb that he shared his table with. This little lamb that he'd curl up and watch TV with. This, this little lamb that they'd, they'd let sleep on the, on the bed at night. This lamb that they loved. It was, it was precious to them. And then one day a traveler comes to the rich man's house, and the rich man wants to be a good host because that's very important. And so he not only gives him a room, he wants to give him a feast. But instead of taking from his own possessions, which were numerous and many, he takes the poor man's precious little lamb to prepare a meal for this guest. Now, remember, David was a shepherd. David had... Loved and cared for many little lambs in his days as a shepherd. And so he is enthralled with this story. So much so that he burns with anger at the end of the story. And he says, how, how could a man who has been given practically everything take the poor man's only precious little lamb? And then he says, as surely as the Lord lives, Nathan, the man who has done this must die. And Nathan pauses for a moment and he, he looks King David in the eye and he says, you are that man. It's in that moment that David is confronted with his sin. The sin of coveting, of adultery, the sin of lying and scheming, the, the sin of murder. And it's in that moment that finally David's heart breaks now, now, we don't know if he dropped to the floor in contrition right, right then and there. We, we don't know if he escaped off to some more of a private area and, and poured his heart out. But what we do know is this. We do know that as part of his act of repentance, he penned the words of Psalm 51. Psalm 51. A sober lesson on the nature of sin in seeking the forgiveness of God. And that is the rest of the story we find in Psalm 51. If you want to flip there, it's on page 457 in your pew Bibles. And what we see in Psalm 51 in the opening words is this passionate awareness. As David has come to a point of realization of just how serious and just how devastating his sin actually is. And he says this in verses 1 and 2. He says, he cries out, Lord, have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all of my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You notice Dave's not even sure where he stands with God at this point. In other places, in other psalms, other expressions, he would start off by saying, my God, my Lord, my Savior, my refuge. He, used the, he would say, my God. Here he is simply saying, oh God. Oh God, I, I feel the gap between who I am and what I've done, and the gap between that and who you are and what you desire. Lord, I feel the gap. Blot it out. Wash it clean. Cleanse me from the sin that caused this gap, this distance between you and I, Lord. And the language he's using here comes from a sort of an ancient Near Eastern tradition 
where if you had crimes or if you had debts that were owed, they, they would write those down on a piece of papyrus or they would write them down on a piece of slate. And then when the debt was paid or, or, when, or, or, or when the crime was forgiven, they, they would erase that off of the slate. They'd erase that off of the papyrus. That's where we get the phrase we sometimes use today to, to, to wipe the slate clean or to start with a fresh slate. That's where that sort of comes from, this idea of let's forget about the past and let's move forward with a fresh start. Now, as we read this and look at this, it may sound like David is saying, God, can, can we just forgive and forget? Can we just pretend like none of this ever happened? And if you think about it, sometimes when, when people are seeking our forgiveness or sometimes when we're seeking other people's forgiveness, it's kind of what we want. Can we just forgive and forget? Can we, can we just pretend like that never happened and let's just, let's just start fresh and move forward? Can we, can we do that? I want you to know this about forgiveness. This idea of forgive and forget. First of all, it's not possible, nor is it healthy. Explain what I mean by that. It's not possible. The reason being, because the consequences of our sin are real. David cannot simply ask, can we just forgive and forget? Because Uriah is really dead. Because Bathsheba is really a widow. There is really a baby on the way. We can't just forget. It's not possible. The consequences are real. But also, it's not possible healthy. Because see, in our own lives, this idea of being able to forgive and forget, if, if we grant somebody that type of forgiveness, it requires us to minimize the significance of the injury they caused to us. In order for us to do that, say, I'll, I'll just forget like that never happened. I'll pretend that nothing ever took place. It requires us to minimize the significance of the injury and the impact that our sins have had upon other people. Our sins matter. The consequences of our sins are real. And we have to, we, we have to be aware of this. And David is. We, we see that's not actually what he's, what he's talking about as we continue to read in verse 3. He says, for I know my transgressions. I don't want to forget them, God. I know them. My sin is always right before me. He says. He knows the Ten Commandments. He, he's, he's done the accounting on this. And he knows kind of what his sin combination, like the combination of his sins that led to his guilt is. He knows he's, he, he's coveted, that's number 10. He knows he's committed adultery, number 7. He's lied, that's 9. Murder, that's 6. So David knows, like, like God, I know I'm like, a, I'm like a 10, 7, 9, 6 kind of sinner. Now, that's probably not your <laughs> sin combo, but, but like, if you give an example, if you've ever lied to your mom about not wanting to go to church, then your sin combo might be like lying, uh, not honoring your mother, and not obeying the Sabbath. So your sin combination in that case, you'd be like a, like a, like a 9 five, four center, okay? Or if you take your neighbor's wheelbarrow without them knowing, and then when they come looking for it and they ask you where it is, you're like, I don't know, I don't know where it is. I don't touch your wheelbarrow. Like in that combination, you're, 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 you're first of all, you coveted, <laughs> and then you stole, and then you lied about it. So your sin combination would be like a, like a, like a, like a 10, 8, 9. It would be who you are. So anyway, whatever your sin combination is, all sin matters. Because all sin damages all relationships in our lives. Regardless of what your sin combination may be, if you just sit back and be like, or kind of where do I struggle the most? What things have I recently tripped up on that I need to acknowledge? Whatever that combination might be, it all matters. And if it goes unaddressed, over time, it'll affect your relationship with yourself, first of all. Because you'll start to feel shame and guilt. And if you allow that shame and guilt to continue, if you allow that sin to continue, if you allow the unconfession to continue, you'll eventually start to identify yourself in that fashion. Well, that's who I am. I guess I'm a thief. I guess I'm a liar. You'll start to identify with your sin. That'll become your identity. It affects that relationship with yourself. Our sin also matters because it affects our relationship with others. When we sin against a person, it erodes trust. And it adds unhealthy baggage to a relationship as well. And, and if it goes on unaddressed long enough, the relationship will never be the same again. It will always have this weight, this question mark kind of hanging over it. And our sin also affects our relationship with God. So it affects our relationship with ourselves, our relationship with others, and it affects our relationship with God. Because sin makes us unrighteous. And God is pure in holiness, 
And because God is holy, he cannot associate with unrighteousness. And so a gap exists in our relationship until that sin is dealt with. That's why David says something very important in verse 4. Very important, but very challenging as well. He says this in verse 4. He says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So God, you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. How could David possibly say, I have only sinned against you, Lord? What about Uriah? Uriah, who lost his life simply for the crime of being a good guy with a hot wife. How could he say that to Bathsheba? Who David used his position of power to take advantage of her, and now she's a pregnant widow. How can he say against you alone, God, I have sinned? And no one else. Now, it's true. He had sinned against other people. And there's no record of this in Scripture, but I'm confident David, as part of this, would have had many conversations and, 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 and offered many apologies and, and expressed much sorrow for his actions towards Bathsheba. And he would, I'm positive, he would have demonstrated these critical steps of, of acknowledging the repercussions of his sins and, and wanting to make restitution and wanting to seek reconciliation. It, it's not recorded in Scripture. I'm, I'm confident those things would have taken place. But, but here's what we see in verse 4. It relates actually to what we read in, in Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4.13 where it says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before who? Before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Let me help you understand how this works, where we can sin against other people, but David can still be true in saying, Lord, against you and you alone I have sinned against. And and we can understand it by understanding this, is that all people are created in the image of God. All of us have God's law written upon our hearts, okay? And when we talk about being created in the image of God and having God's law written upon our hearts, it's like we are mirrors of God's law and we are mirrors of God's glory. So when people see us, when, when, when we see ourselves in the mirror, it's supposed to be a reflection of him. True? We understand that? We're created in the image of God. So when we look in the mirror and see ourselves, when other people see us, they should see a reflection of God when they see us. They should see God in us. But when we sin, we take a piece of God's glory, defined by God's moral law, And we pervert it. We put a smudge on our image. Consider, for example, what you mean by that when we have the, uh, for example, God can bless us with many material blessings that can be used for many wonderful things. But when we take those material blessings, those gifts he's placed in our hands, and, and, and we pervert it through coveting, consider David's sins, through coveting, we've made it a sin. We can take intimacy that's meant to be beautiful expression between a husband and wife, and we can twist it, and it becomes adultery. We can take words that are meant to to build up and explain truth, and we can take those, twist them, and we can use it to tear down and tell lies. We can take something with the ability to give life, and we steal life. And all of a sudden, we have... Murder. Those are David's sins. And now there are these smudges that diminish the beauty and the holiness of the image that we are designed to reflect. You know what's amazing about this? Is that even people who do not hold a belief in God still experience this. They won't attribute it to God But even if they don't have a belief in God, if if you're here, if you're listening online and you still have questions and you're not quite sure about uh, about the reality or the place that you have in God's story for your life, you still can relate to this. You may not attribute it to him yet, but you can still relate to it. Here's what I mean by that. All, All of us know. All of us know that feeling when we experience an injustice in the world, when we experience somebody who has murdered or lied or committed adultery or, or, or coveting and jealous of us, we, when we experience those things in the world around us, whether we have a faith in God or not, there's something in us that says that's not right. That's an injustice that needs to be made right. 
Something must be done to fix this. Even, all of us have that feeling, regardless of our religious affiliation. We also know what it feels like when our actions, when, when our sins injure ourselves and injure others, and then we look in the mirror and we don't see the image anymore. We just see the smudges. We know that feeling as well. This is why David is moved to make this plea to have his mirror wiped clean. He does so in verse 7. Where he says, cleanse me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness again. Let, Let my bones that you have crushed rejoice again. Hide your face, not from me, Lord, but hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. See, see the nature of this request, he relates to a, to a priestly ritual where a person would repent and be cleansed. And the idea being here is that you would, you would make a sacrifice. You would, you would have an animal who would be sacrificed and the punishment that was warranted because of your sin would be transferred to that sacrifice. And the blood that that animal would shed, the priest would then take a hyssop plant and they would dip it in the blood and they would sprinkle it upon the person that needed to be cleansed. And then instead of being identified with the sin, they would become identified with the sacrifice that paid the price for their sins. And that's what David's talking about here is when he looks at himself, he feels like he's this dry, dirty, desolate desert. And he says, Lord, I want to become cleansed. I want to become whole. I want to become pure. Like, like, like as though a fresh blanket of pure white snow would fall upon the dry, dirty desert of my life. And in verse 10, he says these words. He says, so create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Create in me a pure heart, God. Take this old heart, take this blemished image that is guilty of murder and lust and deceit and rebellion. And God, I'm not just asking you to cross it out. I'm not asking you to cross it out because if you just cross it out, when I look at it, I still see it. I'm still reminded of it. God, don't just cross it out. I want you to give me a new heart. I want you to give me a pure heart, a heart that has love for God and hatred for evil. Lord, by your mercy, by your compassion, renew our relationship. Restore my image. Remove the smudges. Lord, cleanse me from my sin. Cleanse me of it, Lord. Wash me clean of it, Lord. Blot it out. Blot it out, cleanse it, remove it, wash me free of it. Because it's only through genuine repentance of our sin to God that this is made possible. And I know there are people in this room, there are people in our homes, there are people in our community who have resigned themselves to being defined by the smudges upon their mirrors. There are people who are resigning themselves to being defined by the sin combinations that are too often just right before them in their faces. They've come to believe that they are no good for God. That somehow they've out God's mercy and his compassion. And now the greater the sin that we commit, the greater the impact and the greater the damage. That's absolutely true to our relationships. The greater the sin, the greater the damage to our relationships. The greater need to acknowledge the repercussions. The greater the restitution. The greater the need and the difficulty towards reconciliation. That is absolutely true. But there is no sin greater than God's mercy and forgiveness. There is no smudge he cannot wipe clean. There is no heart he cannot transplant. There is no life he cannot transform. Amen? And so what keeps us from experiencing this? What keeps us from experiencing this? What keeps David's story of repentance and forgiveness from being our story? What keeps us from that? I think there's a couple of things. The rest of this passage 
David is going to talk here about what he wants to teach people. He's going to talk about how there are lessons that he has learned that he wants to transfer on to other people in his life. i got to switch over to this for a second. And it begins with this. It begins with acknowledging that all of us are sinners. Read about this in, in Romans 3.23, where it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, some people don't want to recognize their sins. They'd rather take a posture of saying, well, I have faults. Yes, there are things in my life that, that I need to work on and I need to improve, but that's who I am. And we know these people when we, when we hear them, we talk to them, because we see that they have ceased the struggle. They are no longer struggling with their sin. They've just accepted that as that's part of who I am. These smudges in my life are part of who I am. Now, there are also other people we'll encounter who will compare themselves to other people. And they'll say, well, relative to them, I'm good people. I'm a good guy. Compared to them, I don't do much. Here's, here's the problem with both of those situations. Is that when we do that, we are making ourselves the definition of what is good and what is bad. We're making ourselves the definition of what is right and wrong. And if you are the standard of such things, you will never see yourself as a sinner. If you are the standard of that, you will never see yourself as a sinner. But once we come to see God as the standard, then we realize all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And once we come to that point, we can then go to the next step of somehow reaching a place where our sin breaks our hearts. So remember when Nathan confronted David with that story? David was furious. He was furious, and he thought, you know, there, there must be justice in this somehow. If you'd walked up to David at that point and said, you know, King David, do you, do you think it's wrong to lie? Do you think it's wrong to covet? Do you, do you think it's wrong to commit adultery and, and to commit murder? He would have said yes. Absolutely. There are violations of the Ten Commandments of God's law. And anybody who breaks those things, I would be willing to hold accountable, he would have said but that was at the point where there was no repentance, where there, where there was no change of attitude or action. You see, it wasn't until his sin broke his heart that this change started to take place. You know, Jesus tells a story in Luke 18 that's, that's similar to this, a story of a, of a Pharisee and a tax collector who go to the temple to pray. 